Okay, we're going to get started now. Thank you for your patience and welcome. Um, my name is Steve Kenzie. I'm the executive director of the UN Global Compact Network UK, um, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the third session in our Climate Action Summit. Um, and this session is Circular Products and Business Models for Emissions Reductions. Um, apologies to those of you that have already been to a couple of the sessions today, but we're going to just repeat the housekeeping and, and a few things that we've been saying all along. So first of all, this session will be recorded um, and we will be making that recording available to everyone that registered at the end of the session. Secondly, we are in webinar mode and that means that our audience will be muted and, and cameras off throughout, but we still uh, want to hear from you. We've allocated quite a lot of time for Q&A in this session, so we're really keen to have your active participation, and there are two ways for you to do that. Firstly, um, if you have a question that you would like our panelists to answer, then please put it into the Q&A box. There's a button at the bottom of your screen that you can open up, and that will um, give you sight of the Q&A, the questions that have been asked so far, and... Um, it will also give you an opportunity where you can put your own questions in there. We really want you to be engaged in this. Um, the last two sessions, we weren't able to get through all of the questions that were presented. And so we need your help in prioritizing the questions. And you can do that by clicking on the thumbs up. If there's a question that's in there that you're really keen to have answered, click on the thumbs up and that will uh, vote it up to the top and improve the likelihood that we'll be able to present it to our speakers. If you just wanna make a comment, we sure are happy for you to do that. You can just say hello, you can share your LinkedIn um, profile, or if you're having a technical difficulties, please use the chat for that. So there's a button at the bottom of your screen for um, inserting comments, and that's the chat. So please, questions in the Q&A, comments in the chat, and we're gonna get along just fine. We've activated uh, closed captioning. Um, you should see a button for that at the bottom of your screen. If you need to use captions, um, please activate that. Um, but do bear in mind that the captions are generated automatically by Zoom. So we, we apologize for any typos, uh, but there's nothing we can do about that. Um, and the last bit of housekeeping is just to ask you if you're gonna be active on Twitter and, and LinkedIn. Um, to please use our hashtag, hashtag CA Summit 2022. Um, we're really keen to drive lots of uh, dialogue, both in our sessions, but also outside of the sessions. And that's going to be a really great help to us if you would kindly use that uh, to tag us and, and also the, the wider conversation. Okay, let's get on to the first slide, which again, um, some of you will have seen recently. Um, and just a quick introduction to the UN Global Compact and the Global Compact Network UK. We're the largest responsible business initiative uh, globally, um, connecting companies and other organizations in a global movement dedicated to driving sustainable growth. There are 17,000 companies and another 4,000 non-business organizations that are participating. Here in the UK, we're the largest responsible business network as well, 700 businesses, another 150 non-business participants in our network here in the UK. We'd be delighted to have you uh, join us if you're not already. To do so is um, requires a commitment from your CEO, and that commitment entails uh, operationalizing our 10 universal principles into everything that your organization does. Those 10 principles are drawn from UN treaties in the area areas of human rights, labor, environment, and anti-corruption, um, making them truly universal because those treaties have been ratified around the world. The second commitment is to report annually on your progress um, towards achieving that, and finally to support the wider UN development agenda, which right now is best reflected in the sustainable development goals. UK Network organizes over 100 events a year like this one, but also lots of stuff that's for our members only. Um, so yeah, there's links in the chat and uh, we'd be delighted to speak with you about joining us. So 
please give that some thought. Okay, next slide. Let's get let's get on to the uh, the special the 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 details. We're taking a deep dive now into the circular economy. Our earlier session, just before this one, provided an overview of how businesses can measure circularity and some of the frameworks and tools that are out there for helping. In this session, um, we, we wanna look more closely at um, the specifics um, around um, products and how you can really build it into product uh, design um, to design out waste and pollution um, and, and extend the life of products. We've got four fantastic speakers to join us today. First, we're gonna hear from Harold Friedel, the cement and aluminum lead or aluminum lead for those of you uh, not North Americans, uh, sorry. Um, he's on the COP27 Climate Action Champions team. Then we're gonna hear from Mark Lancelot, Director of Business Design at PA Consulting. Then we've got Sokna, Sokna Gay, the head of packaging for um, UK and Ireland at Nestle. And finally, Matt Manning, head of circular economy at BT. So fantastic group of experts to get things going. Um, each speaker is gonna provide a brief five minute intervention to get us started. Then we're gonna move on to around, depending on how long that goes, around an hour of Q and A. So um, do please, start firing your questions into the Q&A box as soon as the speakers start. We're gonna collect all the questions up till, till we get into the Q&A session. Um, and so plenty of time also for you to do the voting. All right, without any further ado, I am delighted to present Harold uh, to get us started. Over to you, Harold. Hey, thanks, Steve. And I hope the, the voice and the sound is good. I'm in a shared office. Um, yes, and perfect. I'm happy, I'm happy to um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you for all the work you're okay. doing as you and Global Compact Network. That's fantastic. Thanks for all the practitioners on this panel. Um, I, um, I've been working in the circular economy and I've been proud to work in the circular economy for the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, and not only in the last uh, year or so as accelerator for the government where I'm from, from the Austrian government, I'm Austrian by nature, uh, but also as a former CEO of Circle Economy, one of the big organizations in the world together with the Elmer Arthur Foundation who has been in the last year making very important contribution to making sure the circular economy is accelerating and actually uh, happening. Uh, let me start off with um, a couple of thoughts first on where we are in an important year where we're gonna see the global climate change negotiation happening in Africa, in Sharm el-Sheikh, in Egypt in November, how this is linked with circular economy and the current uh, system where we are in a difficult uh, year with the war in Ukraine. Two, what I think is very exciting, and three, some, uh, some lessons learned from our work in Austria and the importance of building ecosystem for change. So firstly, uh, we are uh, only four weeks uh, before the last uh, climate change negotiation, COP27 happening uh, in Egypt. I think we are seeing a more and more convergence around the topics of circularity and climate. I've been saying this many times, but it's an important point I want to make here. It's really important for all the countries that are making action plans at the moment around circular economy to integrate this and coordinate this very closely with the climate plans, because often and too often still in many countries, these debates, circular economy and climate is happening in parallel and is not integrated enough. So that's a call also from a current position uh, where I work with the Global Climate Action Champion who is tasked by the UN and the member states of the UN to raise ambition. Because we know in the year 2022, we are running out of time and we need to raise ambition and implement accelerated action. So I'm very happy to be part of this team and working very closely with the global cement industry, one of the most heavy emitting industries to make sure this is happening. Two. Uh, exciting. What I really find exciting and I want to give you a couple of examples is the kind of leadership, the kind of investment drive, and third, the new collaboration activities that we are seeing around circular economy. Let me make this very concrete. Leadership, I find it fantastic how big companies like Philips, for example, are really implementing circularity in terms of numbers now into their yearly strategies. So the fact that um, Philips, for example, says now 25% of its sales uh, in the following, uh, in the coming three years has to be covered and 
coming out of circular economy activities is a huge signal that the transformation is happening fast and hopefully faster. Two, investment. The recent report also in the UK shows that the investment in circular economy startups and scale-ups and investment possibilities has doubled in the last two years. So I think that's really a very positive signal. And the fact that recently we have seen the first unicorn, um, a French-based um, remarket uh, opportunity called Rem so Remarket, uh, a second-hand um, market opportunity that is a marketplace is really for me a big encouragement that these big investment opportunities for the investors that are looking for this kind of investments are coming and are rising at the moment. And thirdly, collaboration. Uh, just a couple of days ago, we have heard again from the Circular Economy Electronics Partnership. They launched a blueprint for action. I like it because I think we need to go away from strategies into action plans. So this blueprint for action again underlined how the producers cannot only be responsible anymore for their actions until the point of sale, but how everybody has to start to think about the lifetime of a product and hence raise and really increase collaboration and invest in collaboration that is needed along the value chain. So I think we are heading in the right direction as always, not fast enough. So I call to all of you, let's accelerate action. And thirdly, for my work in Austria as an accelerator for the circular economy in a country, I can only tell you that many, many small startups, but also the big industry players. Um, that's what we saw at the last national circular economy conference. Everybody says we need more of the collaboration around circular economy value chain collaborations because nobody can do it alone. I just want to repeat that message again at the beginning of this session. Nobody can do it alone. Even the big industry players can't. There is an outcry for support. And I think the governments in very smart collaborations with private sector companies and associations need to create these safe spaces for collaboration. Sometimes they are called circular economy hotspots. Sometimes they are called circular economy accelerators. Whatever works in your country, I only can encourage you to engage the public and the private side to make it happen because it's only a question of dialogue so we can unleash the ambition loop that many are talking about that can still make sure we are reaching the climate goals. And for me, the circular economy is one way of doing that as well as reaching a society and economy that serves the people and the planet and not anymore only financial goals. So thank you very much for this. I'm very much looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Harold. Maybe I'm gonna give you a question right away just before, well, firstly, I wanna just, again, in building on your point about collaboration, so critical. Uh, I just, again, wanna remind our audience um, you're most welcome to use our, our chat function here to connect with one another um, so that we can help you know, facilitate some of that, that collaboration starting right now. Um, but, but Harold, oftentimes collaboration comes with uh, some barriers in the form of antitrust legislation. Is that a, is that a, a real concern in this space or, or, or does that come up and, and have you overcome it? No, absolutely. That's a big topic. Uh, I mean, I can say it, uh, for example, in the cement industry, we, uh, we are all seeing this very practically happen. Um, I think they're always, uh, you know, you have to respect the law, obviously, and uh, we can't go, um, um, we can't avoid that. And still, I think we have seen also in my, my uh, when I was CEO of Circle Economy, we have managed to work together with many of the textile organizations in a pre-competitive spirit. Uh, and for this created own safe spaces, so really trusted environments for collaboration. I think it's possible. Obviously, we need to respect the law and it shouldn't be, I think, um, antitrust uh, laws uh, and regulations shouldn't be an impediment to better collaboration. Um, and I think in any industry uh, where we have trusted institutions that are driving this forward, and therefore I managed or I'm... Uh, and next, I, I, um, I said this about different hotspots in different countries where they exist. Once they are set up and the industry understands the power of the public-private collaboration and the governments are also buying into it, there is always a way forward to my mind. And yes, it is a real topic for concern. And uh, in the examples where I've seen, you might end up with establishing minimal collaboration, which is even better than no collaboration. So I think there's always a way forward. And yes, we need to build trust with each other. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Moving right along. Uh, Mark, 
please join us. Thank you. Super. So thank you. Thank you, Steve, for the opportunity and great to meet you all on the call today. Uh, so I'm, I'm Mark Lancelot. I work for, for PA, uh, been a consultant looking at operating model design and business model changes uh, for many, many years. Uh, around 2015, got interested in sustainability and social economy, and that, that's been my focus since then. So I've done a lot of work with startups and scale-ups over the last seven or so years with companies like Enzo Tires, Stuffster, uh, Not PLA, EcoBooth, uh, and also with kind of large corporates who are moving forward with this agenda. So companies like, like Milliken, uh, I've worked with kind of big industrial manufacturers, a couple of global retailers, and in the food and confectionery space as well. So, so I might pick up some of the uh, some of the kind of stories from working with those when we get in the Q&A, but what I wanted to spend the, the five minutes here is just talking about some work that I did with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation, as many of you know, is a big focus on, on circular economy and been very successful in placing it on the, the agenda, both of business and, and policymakers uh, since around 2015 and, and before that. Uh, so we, we, we worked with them for, for a number of years uh, and winding back about four years could see this this need from, from both kind of larger companies and, and startups who, who were buying into the, the big idea of the circular economy but struggling to figure out well how do I apply that in my day-to-day -day job so what, what does it mean uh, and then secondly for some of the startups we were talking to having great ideas that would create positive impact and, and value in the system, but struggling to work out how to monetize that and make them investable startups that could attract uh, investment and scale up that way. So, so that kind of came to this idea of how do we create a playbook uh, to help, help that audience figure through what circular business models might be appropriate for them. So thinking about the different types of models. Uh, so, You'll kind of see on this page, I can, I can put a link in the chat to it as well, uh, but over two to three years we, we co-developed uh, this playbook uh, so as PA in conjunction with Exeter Business School and then working with a number of the organisations that are part of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, so, so big players in the space like IKEA and Philips uh, and, and many others providing kind of feedback and iteration to, to create what we think is a, is a helpful set of resources and toolkit. Uh, and what I wanted to talk to you about was just some of the, the kind of four key insights that kind of led us to shape it that way that, that we've learned from, from looking at and working with circular business models. Uh, so so this, the, the first step you can see here around thinking about where to play, uh, so very much taking a view to, to look at a systems level to understand where waste is uh, being lost or whether it's at risk in the future uh, and thinking about waste uh, and value particularly in a slightly broader sense that's a yes looking at kind of pounds or euros or dollars and also thinking about material waste but also looking at aspects around data and relationships and where there's opportunities to, to think about those differently uh, the, the second piece around how to win uh, very much focusing in to value propositions and thinking about what value propositions are needed both with customers and, and key partners so, so playing back a little bit to, to Steve and Harold and that idea of collaboration being particularly important in circularity you know there's a, a phrase that you know most businesses can't be circular because circular is a property of an economy or a value chain so how do you kind of create the conditions for true circularity up and down the value chain uh, so, so the insight there from, from talking to many businesses was that, you know, rather than a, a business where you make something and sell it, and that can be largely the end of a relationship, particularly in a circular model, there's a need for an ongoing relationship. And that might be about recovering the product or the material at a future point in time or getting data about how it's been used and where it is to, to enable that in the future. So, so there's a, a slightly more sophisticated uh, value proposition that's required that incentivizes the customer to, to, to want to stay engaged with the provider. So kind of thinking about well, how do you create that condition rather than it just being a point of case sale. Uh, the third area is really around kind of operating it. So how do you operationalize it? What capabilities are needed that are different or, or new within a linear business? 
So particularly thinking about things like asset management, uh, customer relationship management, taking a more sophisticated view around how to manage revenue and profit risk over a over a service contract. So how do you do that? Uh, to things like collection, inspection and refurbishment. So, so how do you work out which of those are going to be key, which of those are going to be core competencies you'd need to do yourself versus create, having partnerships with others to do that successfully for you. Uh, and then the last piece around how to profit really kind of plays back to that piece around, you know, how do you monetize and create an investable business uh, as well as potentially having kind of greater impact for the system. So, so clearly some of that's about thinking about service contracts and subscription models, products as a service uh, and what those models might look like. Um, but also thinking about there are other ways to, to put some value on other benefits which might play into the emissions agenda we're talking about today. So that's increasingly valuable for customers in terms of helping meet their ambitions for, for net zero or, or carbon reduction or other aspects around it as well. So again, that piece was really kind of starting to think about uh, slightly more innovative pricing models and setups that would allow businesses to, to, to recognize and, and capture back some of the systems value that they're creating, which might be for stakeholders two or three steps removed in the value chain. So, so that, that's kind of a very brief uh, tour of it. Uh, I'll, I'll post a link in the chat now so you can see it. Uh, obviously happy to take questions on it and as we get into the Q&A you can hopefully bring it to life with some real examples of, of companies we've worked with and, and, and know well in this space. Thank you. Thank you Mark, that's um, that's great to get us started and it will be really interesting to hear yeah some of those examples and because um, it, it's it's easy to say uh, <laughs> you know, redesign your business model, but you know, that's the very essence of a company. So yeah, it really interesting to hear how it's actually being done. Um, very happy to see some questions now coming into the Q and A. Do please keep them coming and, um, and keep voting uh, up for the ones that, um, that you like the looks of. Uh, okay, let's move on now to Sapna. Thank you, Steve. I am really delighted to be with you today. I am Sahna, Head of Packaging for Nestle UK and Ireland. For those of you who don't know Nestle, Nestle is the biggest food and beverage producer worldwide. I am really happy to bring up a topic that I'm super passionate about. As a matter of fact, I have spent the past 15 years of my career specializing about packaging sustainability way before it became so trendy and packaging circularity as well. If we flick onto the next slide, please. I was born in St. Louis, a beautiful estuary between the Atlantic Ocean and the Senegal River. Back in the 80s, I used to swim in this river and this picture that you see here is one that I took a couple of years ago, where I wanted to go back to my memories, to the same river, to swim there with my children. Fortunately, it was not really possible. In this part of the city, there is no rubbish collection. People in these communities can only either dump the waste in the river or burn it in unsafe conditions. Packaging waste in the environment is an issue for communities and people, an issue for our planet, and an issue for businesses like Nestle. As with size comes responsibility, Nestle's vision is that none of our packaging, including plastic, ends up in landfill or as litter. And we know this is a very long-term vision and it will take time really to achieve it. We have therefore, if we move to the next one, please, divided our actions around three big teams and five area. 
less packaging, better packaging, and better systems. If we start with the less packaging, we first are focusing on eliminating unnecessary packaging by reducing the size and weight of packaging. Um, one example that we have introduced in the UK last year is the sharing bag um, that you see here, where we reduce the size by 16%. And we are also at the same time working to reduce the virgin plastic we use through introducing recycled plastic, like for the Buxton bottle, where all bottles are now made from old bottles using 100% recycled PET. Similarly, we need also to really scale up reusable packaging to eliminate the need for disposable packaging. On the better packaging, our Nestle Institute of Packaging Science and our wider R&D network is working on redesigning our packaging for recycling, simplifying their structure, or moving to alternative materials such as paper, where it makes sense and fits in the local infrastructure. On the better systems, we have, for example, last year in the UK invested 1.65 million pounds in the Yes Recycling Plant in Scotland. And the plant is now operational since a couple of weeks. It recycles some of the flexible packaging which are collected from curbside in the Fife Council. And just after this meeting, actually, I'm jumping in a train to go to Scotland to visit this plant. And as you can tell, I'm very excited about it. Furthermore, we also need to drive behavior change for our employees, our customers, our consumers as well. If you and I, we don't return reusable packaging or we don't put the recyclable packaging in the right bin, then it is just recyclable or reusable packaging ending up in landfill potentially. Of course, as Harold was saying, this is nothing that we can do on our own. Value chain wide collaboration and supportive policies will be vital to achieve this. And we are willing to collaborate with all parties. And this is what I wanted to share mainly with you today. And we'd be really happy to engage um, in the Q&A session as well. Thank you. Thank you, Sokna. That's great to get us started. Um, yeah, shock. It looked like solid land, but I'm assuming in that photo of the river, that was floating garbage. That uh, that, that must have been heartbreaking. Um, it okay. was floating garbage, including wow. Nestle packaging as well. Yeah, particularly hard to hard to witness. And I think that's something we're going to come back to because I think it's a very there's so much to discuss about sort of extended producer responsibility and and what happens at the end of life. And I'm particularly interested in the, the division of responsibility. You mentioned, you know, personal responsibility to ensure that things are going into the recycle bin, but I think there's probably a fair bit of concern and even skepticism out there about the systems in place to ensure that even what's in the recycle bin gets processed um, in a in a the way that we feel it it ought to be, um, having made that that effort to recycle it in the first place. So we'll uh, come back to that. Um, do please keep the questions coming in, everyone. Thank you very much, and do keep um, voting for the ones that you're most interested in, most interested in having us address. But now let's move on to our final intervention from Matt, from BT. Matt, over to you. Hi, Stephen. Thanks for having me. Um, really important topic that we're obviously going to be discussing today and just highlighting the fact that how kind of climate ambition and circularity go hand in hand and they're not two separate things. And ultimately, if we want to achieve our net zero goals as a country, as businesses, as a globe, then circularity and a drive towards the circular economy is, is vitally important. So yeah, as it was kind of 
introduced at the start. So I'm um, Matt Manning, I'm head of circular economy at BT Group. Um, for those who don't know, so BT is a, a global telecoms company um, in terms of brands that it kind of operates. You've got um, BT, EE and Plusnet, um, and also part of the um, OpenReach, which is a wholly owned subsidiary um, beneath it that does a lot of the fibre connections across the UK. And in terms of kind of our, our aspirations, you know, by 2030, we're looking to be kind of the most trusted connector of people, devices and machines. I'm sure we've all kind of appreciated over the last couple of years how important, you know, connectivity, be that through broadband and um, mobile networks has been to kind of stay in touch, to connect with loved ones, to do, to do work, to obviously host events like this. So obviously we've got um, big ambitions for fibre rollout and 5G coverage over the next um, few years. And on kind of the sustainability side of kind of ambitions within BT, obviously looking to really tackle digital skills within the population and then more focus on sustainability, looking to have net zero operation by March 2031 and then our wider supply chain by March 2041. And then from an emissions point of view, looking to help support our customers avoid 60 million tonnes of CO2 through the services that we provide. And then particularly around this topic, um, last year set an ambition to have a fully circular business by 2030 and a fully circular kind of tech ecosystem by 2040. And if we jump onto the next slide, and in particular on the topic here, I really want to touch on some of the stuff that BT has been doing in the kind of circularity space, and in particular around our operation that we have for um, refurbished um, equipment. So when a BT customer joins us, you know, you'll have a BT router, you might have a Wi-Fi disk if you're looking to extend it, and if you've got a TV package, you have a set-top box as well. And in 2019, um, any new customer join, there's actually a kind of a change within the T's and C's, which meant actually you didn't own those pits of kit um, and kind of operated under the gratuitous bailment, which essentially means that you you have the those bits of kit for the life of the, the contract that you're with us. And then should you leave or for every reason need to change the the, the, the uh, kit, you then need to send that back to, to BT. And if you didn't, then you expose yourself to be um, kind of have, have a charge for it. And as a result, that meant we've seen a, a huge uplift in equipment coming back. And then this kit that comes back, we don't just kind of send it straight for, for recycling. It goes to our partner up in Scotland who actually do a um, whole refurb operation there. So, so last year we had 1.35 million devices come back through through this, this take back from, from customers' equipment. And when it gets to the site up in Scotland, they essentially um, wipe it. So they plug it in because you can appreciate these bits of kit have, you know, if it's a TV set-up box or Wi-Fi, it holds the elements of, of data in it that gets wiped it gets then tested to see if those they still work um then it's kind of cosmetic checks um because some of it can be scratched and then they'll replace those and then it's reboxed and actually 97 percent of the stuff that comes back then goes back into our stock warehouse to then go you know be able to go back out again to to new customers and then the three percent that either doesn't pass the kind of the wiping or the test or the cosmetics element then goes to downstream partners who then essentially break those um equipment apart to recycle the plastics and the hard drives and the equipment that's that's inside. And linking to this, I suppose, particular topic is actually that, you know, what's the, the benefit of, of doing all of that? So in that kind of bottom right um, corner there, you'll see that actually we did some work with um, an organization a couple of years ago to actually analyze what is in particular the kind of carbon benefit of, you know, a new um, set dot box and router versus a, um, a refurbished one. And on average across the different categories of products, there's a 91% carbon saving um, from the, you know, redoing the refurb activity and then putting that back in stock than buying a new one. Um, obviously, a large number of that, chunk of that comes from obviously the, the materials that go into it in the manufacturing process, because in particular around tech, a lot of the footprint is actually in the, the manufacturing stage, because from an energy point of view, they're not as energy hungry as say, you know, a, a fridge or a, or a tumble dryer. And then from the from the cost side of things as well, there's a huge cost saving. So on average, it's about 82% um, saving versus buying those same products in new than the kind of refurb operation. And then last year, as you can see in the top right hand corner, about 450,000 refurbished equipment actually went out to to, to to customers there. So essentially, you, know, you can't tell the difference. They look exactly the same. So that's avoided us essentially buying nearly half a million new bits of kit in because we've taken stuff back from old customers, refurbed it, tested it, and then it goes back into stock to be circulated again. So it's a prime example that you know we, we've got within BT of both the, the carbon benefit because it's avoided us buying a whole load of new kit, which all has its own carbon footprint within our upstream scope three. And also you've got cost saving as well there. So it's really bringing that to life and quite prevalent for this topic here. And you're happy to kind of discuss more and some wider stuff that BT are doing as well.
go. Thank you, Matt. Fantastic. And I'm seeing a lot of love for this project uh, in the comments, which is uh, which is great. It, it seems a, a fantastic initiative. Can I ask you maybe to just to get started now uh, as we we're going to transition over into the into the Q&A phase. So please, everybody, keep those questions coming um, and, and do keep on voting up the questions you like. Um, and uh, Harold, oh yeah, start my video. Sorry, I thought I had done. I beg your pardon. There we go. And yeah, and everybody else, let's do that too. Um, I'm going to point this at you, Matt, but I, I really welcome everyone else coming in on it. Um, and you, you sort of answered it, but maybe we, we need to widen it out. In the last session, the point was made that it wasn't perfect alignment between circularity and reducing emissions, and that there would be potentially a scenarios where the circular uh, model was actually higher carbon um, than the non-circular one. But then that was qualified that there were all sorts of other benefits to circularity and, and the more holistic approach and that we were also hitting you know materials thresholds and so on that that needed to be considered so this project certainly seems you know brilliant um and especially where you have a longer term customer and i imagine your your contracts do get renewed and and extended um is that a trade-off that you you, it, it's you know you you did say it was a ninety one percent savings on on emissions, but I'm just thinking that that delivery that the sending it back and forth, you've you've looked at all of that, and and it works. Yeah, so if you look at the so it was the the carbon trust we worked with that did the analysis of I think it was um, four or five of the different models of routers and set top boxes, and actually if you look at the kind of the footprint when they did the breakdown transport is it is, you know had a, a very small percentage of it the, the bulk of it where that big saving is obviously the the energy and end of life figures are the same across whether it's a you know a new device or uh, a reefer because when you plug it in it's still going to use the same amount of um energy and then similarly if then both went down the recycling route they still got the same footprint so the big chunk of that saving is in that material element of you know the, the footprint of the man the, the brand new manufacturer of that of that product and actually the the emissions linked to kind of the refurb activity um and the kind of transport is is is, is fairly minimum um on it on it so yeah the actual activity of doing it and I'm, and I'm sure there are potential examples out there where there could be circular activities which might not have the similar payoff but certainly in this case when we did the kind of analysis on it there was that kind of that saving there from a, a footprint point of view uh, you know it's probably my personal bias because i've just moved house uh, literally you know two days ago and and we've had a, a a van deliver a new fridge today and we've had so i was just had this picture of a a van coming to pick up all this stuff but of course if we're just dropping it in the post that, that's all very low carbon um yeah the the, the, the the return back call route is they get a royal mail um postage step so then obviously they then go to royal mail which then obviously a, moving millions of parcels around all in one go and obviously there's multiple stuff coming back to our our supplier so yeah it's not like a dedicated van goes yeah, out to yeah. my house to pick up an item right uh, i'm does anybody else want to comment on this maybe yeah yeah I, mark yeah I'd jump in. So, when i know earlier this year there was just some press around the sort of uh, fashion rental and the fact that some calculations showed that could have a higher footprint uh, I think the point is you have to look at it and do do the work and make the right choices. You know, it's not a silver bullet that's always going to work. So if, you know, in that case, if you're shipping clothes up and down the country and using transport with a high carbon footprint, you know, it's going to have an impact. Uh, and similarly, you know, the dry cleaning process has uh, got a big footprint as well. And there's particular chemicals in there have a huge difference as well. So you kind of have to look at it and make make the choices around what's going to be the right return route and where you place centres, uh, how you incentivise people to do it, rather than just assuming it's a you know it's a binary it is or it isn't. It's not as simple as that. Right. Yeah. Harold, do you want yeah, to come in? Yeah, I'd love to come in here too because an interesting one. I think we have the similar debate about uh, in climate too. A lot of the infrastructure that we actually need to make a net zero transition happen doesn't exist yet. Look at all the electric vehicles. That's a big debate there. And I think we need to build a lot of the infrastructure now, which will end up with higher emissions in the meantime. 
yes, that is what we have to accept. I think if you look at the broader, I'm often slightly, I have a, a, I have a challenged feeling when I get these arguments, as you just said now, because we all know, obviously, circularity, circularity reducing the demand for resources, using less and making it smarter to close the loop is something we have to do. It's very logical. It's part of a new system. It's part of a different treatment of resources and eventually people and hopefully also finances. So it shouldn't be an argument somewhere it's sideline and it, it distracts us from the main debate. We have to build, and that's a difficult task that cannot be done by one company alone. The infrastructure to make circular economy happen at least in a national level, but also maybe in a European level. And that will demand for us, uh, our, our countries, our cities to build a new infrastructure. So it shouldn't deviate from the debate that we actually have to go circular. That's, that's it's out of the question. Now the debate is how fast can we build smart infrastructure and how fast can we uh, adapt our consumer behavior? I think that's the real question to me. Uh, and yes, there are definitely trade-offs to make. And I think uh, generally as an economist, I would argue an infrastructure that you build for a country will be smarter than built for one business because it will be always be difficult. That's why at least the big uh, companies I work with in telecom sector, food sector, and also in the built environment, always say we can't do it alone. We need national plans for that. Yeah. You've given me, I'm going to skip down the, the votes a little bit because that, that's a, such an obvious segue to the question that, that Esther has asked. And I think it's a really important question. Um, how economical will this repackaging with reusable or recyclable material be for small companies? Maybe we just build that out a little bit. Um, it's a frequent question. You know, a lot of our participants in the Global Compact are SMEs and real concerns about the creating barriers for them to participate. Um, there, are, there are a whole, you know, a whole other set of of risks associated with concentration of um, of all the business in a few of the the biggest players. And now here today we've got you know two of the biggest players uh, in terms of BT and and Nestle. Um, is that a solution, Harold? Is greater government involvement taking some of this? You know, a project like the the excellent initiative that Matt described, but taking it out of the out of the ownership of of, of that company and making it a you know a government led initiative so that you know electronics are being recycled through um, a more public infrastructure um, in order to keep down those those barriers to entry. Um, what do we think about I mean, this? I, yeah, I, I I I love this debate, you know, because we we are getting into very uh, difficult waters here often because I once I gave a, a, a speech in London at the uh, at Chatham House. An investor then he quickly said to me, ah, you are a socialist. Because I was arguing, wouldn't exactly that argument, would it not make sense to solve this kind of question on a national level? I think businesses, it's fantastic also around the climate change negotiation to see the strides, the leadership that businesses take. And can they solve the problem we have created for each other in the public space alone? No, it needs investment from the public side. I think that is a very uh, an issue that we have to that we have to deal with. I think uh, a plan for a country can only be made by government and its people. And then in the different industries, this has different um, this has different uh, implications. Business will lead as far as they can go. Can they build a whole infrastructure for a country? I don't think so, especially when they are not a monopoly. So I would definitely see a strong role for smart government, not a takeover of government, but a government that leads the way and actually says, and I see this now in my own country, Austria, without a strategy and a clear action plan where we want to go in a country on circular economy, which is linked, close linked to climate, businesses can't unleash what they do best, which is innovate, bring people together and find smart solutions and new business models. So definitely, I think it needs to come leadership on top of what the business sector shows, clarify the frameworks where a country is going, align investment behind that, then the solutions will fall into place much faster. It occurs to me, you know, once you started speaking that Sokna and Matt, you're probably on opposite ends of this. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that BT is probably getting some real, you know, brand value from having this 
this project and and because i mean certainly we saw the reaction to it in the chat it it really is uh it, i could see you wouldn't want to give that up because it, it it's a way to differentiate um from competitors but meanwhile sakna um you're not going to initiate uh only dealing with nestle packaging you're you need um that that's broader sort of state societal level approach did you want to comment on this question maybe sakna first yeah absolutely we need actually the wide um, value chain collaboration and we do need actually absolutely supportive policies toward the circular economy to achieve all this policies even if businesses are innovating we have been doing a lot but policies helps level the playing field um, and it helps to build the infrastructure as well for reusable packaging because that was the start of the question scaling up reusable packaging is really a new business model we are comparing reusable packaging with a single use business that has gone on for a long amount of time now and that has been really optimized for years so we cannot necessarily come first day and compare economically a single use model to reusable model to make that work to make it scalable policies will need to help and infrastructure needs to be available as well for reusable packaging um, it has to be convenient for people to bring back their packaging you know even um, people who are very environmental aware will not necessarily take 20 containers to go to the supermarket to refill them with different type of products and um, so we have to find ways where it is a standardized infrastructure and standardized model for a lot of companies. And that requires both collaboration between companies with academia, with the government as well, um, and with really all the, the players um, in the value chain to make it happen. Um, and even for us, actually, as a big player, um, honestly, this is where it's still a big nut to crack. How do we scale up reusable and refillable packaging? Because we need to reduce the amount of single-use packaging we have um, in order to not um, uh, just have reliance on recycling. There are limits to what we can achieve with recycling. Reuse have a big role to play in a circular economy and working together with supportive policies is how we can achieve it. How how uh, enthusiastic is the retail sector to uh reusable product i could see there being a barrier right there in, in sort of the the shelf space required um from them are, are they collaborating with you in this area or or is there resistance i think more and more actually we see collaboration um really across all the parts of the business we are seeing in the uk for example there are a lot of retailers which are piloting refill stations um and seeing how they can make it work for now it's small pilots it's nothing that reach a significant scale but it's a lot of learning that industry is gathering in order to move that in that direction um but again it's it's coming back to making it um <laughs> making the policies to support that yeah we have to have the freedom in businesses, but to a, at a certain point, if we want things to change and to happen, we need to have strong policies where everyone has to comply to the same thing, and it will help all society move in the same direction. Some incentives to counteract the at least initial perceived inconvenience uh, of changing our, our ways of, of operating. Matt, do you want to come in and then we'll we'll go to Mark? I'd be interested to hearing how how that you know th this initiative of yours is yeah fits into the into BT. Yeah, I think just to echo some of the points there in terms of policy. I mean, for the last you know 20, 30 years, policy and consider obviously speaking about kind of electronics is very much been focused on you know recycling and it's all kind of geared around that, which kind of now this day and age is kind of like the final thing you want to do with bits of you know electronics and, and, and tech and you know in the space of kind of reuse there is no kind of at the moment anyway huge focus or levers are on on that you know there's I know there was a couple of years ago about you know putting towards the government about you know lowering 
VAT on, on, on repair to make it more attractive um, and, and, and kind of get taken forward. And I know a few Nordic countries have obviously have explored that and do it just to kind of reduce that barrier for people to be able to kind of re repair stuff. And it comes, it, and it's the point as well, you know, you've got those same challenges of, you know, convenience um, from a kind of a recycling point of view. So obviously those, that example I gave was, you know, BT's own own devices, but you know, certainly the EE brand, we sell you know, a whole range of, you know, smartphones and, and tablets from, you know, other, other brands. And again, it's kind of, you know, at that end of life phase or end of kind of changing, it's kind of how do you overcome those barriers where actually, you know, particularly with data bearing equipment, people are quite, you know, it's personal and a lot of people kind of stick on it and hoard it. And then, you know, you've got millions of devices sitting in, in cupboards and, and, and in drawers at homes, which actually, you know, have, especially in the electronic space, huge volumes of material, some of them critical. Um, and as, you know, being quite well publicised, you know, some of those materials are in countries that have, you know, 80% of, of, of that material and, you know, that material that could be recovered and help towards drive towards kind of the, the green economy growth that we need for, say, like, like EVs and wind turbines. And it's just sitting in, in cupboards being being wasted. But ultimately, you've got to overcome those barriers of, on, of convenience at the moment, you know, certainly within the UK, you know, other than a handful of kind of retail stores or organizations like ourselves that offer kind of a take back solution for equipment people either have to kind of get up and make the effort to go to a you know civic community site to, to do that or even just struggle to understand you know what they can what they can do with that, that that kit and also now you know what options are there for repair obviously right to repair came out but actually it still is channeling people down a, kind of a professional route um, or a professional repairer rather than you know you or I could get some kit on online and do it do it ourselves so there's still a lot of work to do in that space to kind of move us away from just thinking about weight-based recycling and you know what those figures are, like, are moving up that kind of hierarchy of, of, of action thanks matt mark did you want to come in on this yeah just so just your observations around around the kind of retail point so you know some of the big retailers have been quite active in, in driving this agenda so so I'm particularly thinking about tesco's in in the uk and walmart in the us uh, and, and working with and I guess challenging some of the brand owners to take action in this space. Uh, so, so one of the clients we worked with last year is big international grocer looking at specifically around around packaging and plastics uh, and the things that I suppose spurred them to action were, were sort of a future view of likely legislation and compliance costs and starting to see what might come out of the EU and UK and elsewhere, really starting to change the cost calculation uh, that they needed to act on. Uh, and then the other thing that, that's really in, in their minds at the moment is access to recycled content. So, you know, we see a lot of these, you know, 30% recycled plastic content and the, the demand, you know, is already uh, forecast to outstrip supply, you know, and the cost of recycled PET is higher than natural PET at the moment. So, so there's some kind of cost dynamics going on there as well, which is starting to accelerate action around this. And then, and then last point, just to link it back to the, the kind of emissions agenda, you know, there's, there's some complex trade-offs to, to make here, you know, so the, the kind of slightly trite example that gets brought up is you know, the cucumber and the, the shrink wrapping on the cucumber. You go, well, why do I need that? I can take that off. Well, actually, that extends shelf life considerably. And if I take that off, uh, you know, I end up with more waste in the supermarket chain and in the home and then the carbon footprint of wasted food. So, you know, how you kind of balance off, you know, some of the benefits of the packaging at the moment uh, in terms of kind of carbon footprint, as well as customer experience versus the plastic usage. And how do you find a solution which can, you know, be a substitute or can we think about different sort of production and distribution patterns which shorten the kind of shelf life required, you know, opens up some quite, quite complex uh, areas to look at uh, and at the moment you know a lot of the the refill and reuse ex are their experiments so it's how do we work out how do we make this work you know from a consumer perspective from a, a retail perspective from a brand perspective so a lot of this is around testing and learning to figure out what solutions will work in practice and given the small scale they won't have the economics yet but you know the hope is over time these things scale to a point where they do open up and they're accessible to SMEs, but I think at the moment we see it more driven by, you know, kind of large players trying to take the responsibility and drive it forward 
or, or innovators very much focus on trying to find solutions that work in that space. Thanks, Mark. Okay, let's go back to the Q&A and, and let me just again uh, encourage everyone. Now we've got quite a few questions uh, to deal with here. Um, hard for me to keep up with reading them all. So if, um, if you would be so good as to click on the thumbs up for the questions you'd like us to prioritize, that would be uh, hugely helpful. And of course, do keep the questions coming. So now let's look at the, the top of the list right now and the unanswered questions from David Sizer. We've sort of been working around this, but maybe just a, a last a last chance um, before we move on um, from recycling. David says, in terms of the barriers to improving recycling rates, are these primarily from lack of infrastructure or uh, willingness of industry to accept re recycled materials or from lack of regulation, cultural barriers, or internal packaging issues or a mix of all of these? Um, I can take yeah. this. Okay, Sakna, you first yeah, and then Mark. I can start. Um, I believe it's really a mix of all of those, actually, and it really depends in the end which country are we talking about. As we are in the UK, if we look at the UK, um, there is really a lack of consistency of collection already to start with. If you live in one London borough or in the other one, the recycling is not the same. Um, I am actually in the UK since six months and have lived in three different places. In those three different places, it was three different recycling. So it is really difficult already to be able to educate people, the public, to know what to put in the right bin if we don't have consistency across the country. And to have that consistency, it's again about regulations. Then we have also a lack of infrastructure um, to be able to increase um, sorted material and to increase recycling rates as well. And a lot of contaminations coming from the fact that not necessarily all the packaging are designed for recycling right now, and some of the packaging are still difficult to recycle. It's not that they are not recyclable. Everything can be recycled. It's just whether it can be economically recycled or not. In the end, it's also the economics. It has to have a value. Which value are you getting out of it in the end? And that's why the redesigning the packaging for recycling is a key element in order to give it more value and to make it um, making economical sense to keep it in the circular loop. Um, so in the end, it's it's really a mix of everything. I'm happy to hear from others on that, but I suspect we're going to get the same answer that it's it's probably uh, is across the board. So shall we shall we move on to the next question from Lily? Um, there are clear there are some clear examples. Oh, it moved. There we go. There are some clear examples of where the principles of a circular economy can be used to both reduce demand of products, demand for products, and not be at odds with businesses' ability to increase the profits. For example, the rental market for luxury clothing. So I think interesting innovations that are still allowing companies to be profitable. So is it possible for all businesses to contribute to the circular economy and benefit economically from it? Are we gonna have winners and losers here? Some, some business models that just can't be changed? Uh, does someone feel like weighing in on this? Or have I just answered it, that, that there will be? I, I can have a go. So, so I think there's a, there's a timing piece. There's some, some industries, uh, I suppose, more ready. Uh, and I think it's partly back to this bit about whether economics are starting to stack up. Uh, you know, and you can think about well, what helps you get there, and some of it can be about technology becoming available to to, to make the economics work, uh, or it can be about the kind of partnerships being in place and the infrastructure to do it. So, so I think it's there's a timing piece. Uh, you know, obviously there's a transition period. There'll be winners and losers during the transition, uh, and and some some products, are, you know, it's more challenging in terms of how you address them. I think that's a that's a good answer. Um, and I was just going to add to that. I suppose depending on the type of product or service you offer, it will be dictated by I suppose the the consumer of those products whether they're willing to 
change how they used to consume that type of product so if you you know a physical like you know tech item suddenly if you move from just owning it and you can lease it out you might be comfortable with that but there may be certain types of product where actually people want to own it and they don't want to think of actually oh, oh this someone's already used this item or stuff like that so i think yeah in some it will differ from kind of segments and depending on what you, what you provide based on the willingness of obviously your audience and your customer to kind of ultimately because they need to shift with you as well to say okay we're we're now shifting our business model where everything is leased out or you don't own it and, and things like that or you know it's product as a service type model and we've seen examples of that haven't we where it's been inter the interface carpet kind of really changing that whole sector in, in ways that hadn't been imagined before but but people were able to adapt and of course also i guess it's a moving target isn't it um if the price of recycled pet doesn't uh adjust accordingly with with the price of virgin material um that's clearly going to have a, an effect on on how this stuff works and, and that market okay let's can, can i add to that Steve? oh yeah that's please Harold. go ahead because I, I recently gave an interview to a big market research company and i think when i was preparing for this we are experiencing a huge shift in consumer behavior this is coming i mean we have to acknowledge that that's why we're changing consumer behavior markets will change markets will be more open to high-end products to have products with a green premium this is clearly happening hopefully faster than slower to, from, from my perspective and i think it, it's safe to say certain products will also not be acceptable anymore in five years you know with a certain footprint i think the the whole perception of, of consumers around and i see it with my own daughter she is 75 percent shopping her clothes secondhand and i think that is a really interesting observation we see it everywhere i said um, um uh, we market as a as a secondhand platform these evaluations from over a billion and being unicorns i mean that shows that there's a really a new market so yes it's it's happening and it's changing and the, with that also uh, we will see new players entering the market and i think that's really positive news and i think we're seeing a future that is much more sustainable and green and circular thanks harold mark do you want to come in yeah i just, I just wanted to build on that so so i think what we've seen through some of the the consumer research we've done and, and from talking to a lot of I guess, with large brands and, and sort of startups you know that there is a segment of people who care and being frank can afford to care and pay a green premium but there's a lot of people who can't or, or won't and the the kind of consistent message we get is if you ask people who care about sustainability you know absolutely you know big 80 90 percent now people say it's really important to them if you ask them what it means in practice they're actually pretty confused around what they should do in terms of purchasing behaviors and what to do with, with products around it. And, and what it means is that they're, they're looking for, for brands and companies to help them do it and to make it easy. So, so if you can find a way of creating a sustainable, a sustainable product, it's, you know, a similar experience and at a similar price point, then that suddenly becomes a huge source of competitive advantage it becomes a way that you know of, of retaining and attracting customers to do it and that's the sort of consistent message that we we hear over the last few years and we, we see in practice as well thanks now i'm torn because i i got two different directions that i'm tempted to go in but i i think i want to build out a little more on the consumer side of things first and then i think we'll segue over to the more the business case and how you sell this stuff internally and, and the question from from joshua so Sokna, a challenge to you but i think i think this also applies um you know to, to all all goods so so matt i think you know we'll, we'll come to you after perhaps and, and just to talk about that the range of products that are on the model on the market so so joshua has written um what are nestle doing to reduce the volume of products available do consumers really need so many uh choices and um so simplifying packaging is is surely a, a simple solution um but i guess with so many different um options on the table 
that that limits it. So the, so the, the finally, would Nestle join a cooperative with other brands to systematically reduce consumer choice? That that seems like a very uncapitalist um, proposition. What, what do you think about that? I think actually as a consumers, we have choices and a company like Nestle respond to demand. So the product that we are making, we make them because we want to produce good food for people, but at the same time, people actually are asking for those products, the different varieties that we have. So in the end, as a consumer, we can make choices. If we think that it's too much, you, you can demand for better and you can demand reduction. So I think some of, some of these questions actually have more to go into the people as a citizen. And um, I don't see really why brands such as Nestle will in the future really reduce the offering if there is no bad impact on the environment or on people's health potentially, for example. Um, and in any case, we are reducing more or less actually the number of brands and products because we have just to focus on the ones that are really adding benefits to people and adding benefits to society as well. So overall, it's going in, the, in, in that direction in any case. Matt, what's happening in the consumer electronics space? Yeah, so I think um, to kind of echo those points as well, I think it's getting to a position where, um, you know, enabling the customer to be making informed choices. Because now if you're out shopping and stuff and you're, you're looking, there's very little information from, you know, in, in most cases around the environmental impact of of that particular you know, product or technology that, that you're buying. So you're seeing, you're seeing a lot of things kind of appear to help that. So in the space of um, kind of um, smartphones, there's a new kind of eco rating system, which um, I know ourselves within EE, Vodafone and, and a few of the European um, telcos have signed up to essentially um, requires basically a, a rating from the from the phone manufacturer of those particular handsets across five different measures around kind of um, you know, durability, um, repairability, and it, you know, it gets a score. And similar within France, a couple of years ago, they relaunched their repairability index which kind of scored um, a certain swathe of electronic products from kind of zero to ten again around kind of repairability availability of parts and putting scores up there so I think it's getting to position of actually just providing more information to consumers so when they are buying you know whatever it might be because you still have to kind of cater for for it um, in terms of you know people at the lower end of the market you don't want to kind of you know cut those off and just only have you know the very kind of high-end most efficient for example you know washing machines the most efficient ones tend to be the more kind of heavily priced so if you're just going to stock all of those suddenly for the kind of low-income families there's no product for them to be able to afford so you kind of still have to have that range of, of, of products available but just providing that information and make them aware of this particular product might score poorly on this but it's high on this um and then over time retailers and brands then may get to the point where yeah you are doing choice editing but still kind of keeping an eye on the fact that you need to kind of cater for your particular kind of segment of market um, to make sure, you know, you've got a product in place that can kind of have that kind of high end to, to the low end. It sounds like market forces will largely uh, sort that out then. And if, if there's excessive choice, it's not going to sell. And, and so the companies themselves will make, make those. Yeah, and I think as you start seeing potential kind of, yeah, traffic light systems and ratings coming in as a brand you you don't want your product probably appearing as the, the worst one there and getting kind of the bad press then you'll make active steps in a similar way where you saw kind of the eco design regulations focus on energy you know they've obviously re recently regraded them so now what was a aa plus um say washing machine now might be a b it's then tend to obviously then it's moved the scorecard down to then drive those companies to basically kind of create more and more efficient products um because you know essentially you don't want your one to be in the, you know the most poor performing one so it kind of I suppose drives that element of competition within kind of the oems to make improvements around their around their products and some convergence where it doesn't necessarily restrict choice so I, i'm thinking now of just the standardization of of charging um plugs and so on where there, there's progress that can be made 
um, without necessarily uh, impacting on choice. Yeah, Mark, did you want to comment? Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on on the washing machine example. Uh, you know, Matt was talking about. So, so there's some you know some interesting companies, particularly in the Netherlands, who are trying to enable better access to, to laundry and, and high end washing machines, which are more efficient and, and hence cheaper. So, you know, offering them on as a so product as a service basis so rather than buying a washing machine and that kind of big capital spike at the front which many people can't afford having a different model where it's that that's kind of capitalized over a period of time either by usage or a service contract so, so there are ways if you think about the business model and the, the, the value proposition and pricing differently that you can start to make sustainability more affordable for the people who perhaps aren't at the top end and can buy a you know very expensive washing machine Thanks, Mark. Steve, I have a, can I come in here? Yeah, of course, I, please. Yeah. I was just, I'm just inspired to have a question because I'm often asked that and I would love to hear an answer also from a UK perspective. How do we actually make sure that we are incentivizing to change consumer behavior faster? What is uh, what's then going in the, in the UK? I'm asking this as a question because I think that's uh, the underlying driver. If we, if we manage to change it faster, then a lot of the new business models will be affordable, feasible, and also profitable. What do you guys think? Who wants to start on that? I think uh, Matt, where do, where do you feel on sort of responsibility to to shift consumer demand? Yeah, I think um, if I focus on kind of particular sector within s smartphones, you're already kind of seeing that shift happening. You know, more and more people look at saying you know, re refurbed handsets and it's almost kind of a um a consequence as um you know as new smartphones come out there's actually not a huge difference between each model that, that, that that's coming out so then people are thinking you know why do i need to you know fork out a thousand pounds for a, a, a brand new phone and then obviously you've got all the all those older you know what two or three years old devices come back which still ultimately for the large swathes of people out there um still does the job they need you know it connects to a network you can get on your apps you can do phone calls check your emails so i think you're seeing you know um you know that that growth in the kind of refurb um market there um for for, for consumers to kind of you know think actually and i think you know um i've always used the example of you know we've been quite comfortable for years you know buying secondhand cars living in secondhand homes and i think you've seen that slow shift of people realizing actually you know when people talk about you know secondhand tech it, initially in the head of both think when they buy it it'll be knackered bashed up cracked screen but actually there's great organization out there and people we work with who take our stuff to refurb it and repair it you can never you wouldn't tell it was used and, and you're seeing a similar thing like clothing company and, and, and apps like vinted suddenly huge growth there of people are sitting on clothes there is some value in there you can then sell it make and especially in this climate where you know cost of living is going up make some money out of it and actually people are realizing you know it's not about you know it's not a taboo to buy secondhand clothes, buy secondhand tech. So I think you're slowly seeing that kind of that shift across for, for people realizing that, you know, what was probably seen quite niche is a growing sector. And I think you'll then see businesses and tech companies, uh, you know, um, startups kind of really kind of going after the, those opportunities where there could be products or services that, you know, helps then circulate, you know, secondhand products and used products back to consumers again, which are typically then, you know, lower footprint and typically lower cost as well. Sopna, are you, what sort of investment, I suppose, for want of a better word, is Nestle making in, you know, what share of marketing? Are, are, is that something you would do, is, is give over some of that marketing voice to try and persuade consumers not just to buy your stuff, but to to make more sustainable choices to what, it, I suppose, to that extent, those are aligned with your more sustainable choices? It is fully aligned. What we are doing is really building it in the products we are making. Packaging is just one element. And in the end, if we look at our carbon footprint, packaging accounts for 10% overall. So we are also working a lot on the other aspect of sustainability on regenerative agriculture to make sure that we contribute towards our net zero emissions, our net zero commitments as well. And 
in the end, something I want to bring up, let's not forget currently the cost of living crisis that we have um, in all countries. And in the UK, inflation has been um, really on the roof. So right now, a lot of the priorities for people is really to be able to afford day to day the food, um, the energy that they have. But at the same time, we businesses, we have to make sure that we are not um, being um, not focusing anymore to our long term sustainable goals. So we are actually trying to really um, focus short term to meeting the demand of affordability and longer term to continue making sure we are innovating in our products to continually reducing the environmental impact to make them regenerative, to make them more circular so that whatever choices we offer to consumers will be better choices anyway in the future. And we have a lot of examples of those already in the market. Thanks, Sokna. Harold, do you wanna follow up? Did, did we get to the answer that you were, did, did we answer the question you were posing? Or please. Uh, you, you are, you are the master of ceremony and tell, tell me, I'm, I think it's always interesting, you know, to ask this question, the core of it all is our need and desire to have the latest goods always at our hands. Are we answering it together in a satisfactory way? I think, uh, you know, future generations will judge that. And I think we all have a good gut feeling uh, if we are actually doing enough. And so I want to leave it to everybody who is listening in there. I don't make this judgment. It's not up to me. Um, and I think uh, myself also, it's exciting to see what the new generation is doing in terms of different consumer behavior. Um, and I think we all need to um, challenge each other continuously on the journey to keep uh, this wonderful planet intact, you know? Could we ask though, from your Austrian perspective, do you feel society and state are doing more to influence consumer behavior towards sustainability or or do we need to look elsewhere for for inspiration if you compare it with the uk i mean yeah uh, interesting question i think uh, the austrians are like a bit like the germans they see themselves as recycling uh, championships of uh, europe or the world so they're very good in recycling <laughs> And we all know that this uh, focus on recycling is not what the circular economy is about because the circular economy is truly about shifting the system uh, and uh, recycling is being an important part of this. Um, I think, as, uh, as I said before, uh, the government, I think I'm lacking leadership from the government. Um, I don't believe in government as their own solution provider at all. But policy making is shaping the frameworks of the behavior of companies and individuals for the next years, that's clear. To shift that faster, as we have seen in the past, I think we need more a smarter, a smarter regulation and we need more smarter incentives. Look at the European um, topic of the right to repair at the moment. I think that's a really interesting one uh, that is happening at the moment uh, on the European level. Because if you ask companies that they have to instill the right to repair within the work on their supply chains, that opens up a new opportunity for business and collaboration. I think Austria is not necessarily, an, it's an example for many things, especially for a good lifestyle. And it has a very different uh, societal model than you have in the UK with higher taxes. Um, for example, providing for uh, social services. Uh, look for the good things in, in, in Austria. I think the high percentage of renewable energy is really good one. Uh, that there is now a minister that says we need a circular economy strategy that is more ambitious than in the past is a positive one. And like in uh, the UK, we have some interesting companies that are leading the world transition on circular textiles, for example. So I think there is a lot to learn from each country, uh, especially when we are now talking, and I wanna anchor this a little bit, uh, talking about the preparation of the uh, climate change negotiation that will happen in Africa. Don't forget the World Circular Economy Forum is gonna happen in Rwanda, in Africa. And let's look for the interesting examples that are coming out from our friends and colleagues in African countries so we can keep on learning from each other. Thanks, Harold. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, we're running out of time now, and I'm just trying to look at maybe some quick wins here. And I, Mark, you mentioned in one of your written answers, and I know you've worked on seaweed-based packaging. Christian asks, to what extent are UK organizations embracing non-traditional food packaging? 
Um, could we have a really quick answer on that? Has there been much uptake on on? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of interest in you know alternative materials like seaweed or, or pulp is another big one that we're, we're doing a lot of work with. Uh, I, th I think with all of these things, you know, they're in a sort of scale up space where trying to find the exact use cases and applications. So, you know, which, which exact which products are they good for now, and how do you build the sort of delivery models for them? Um, but you know, I know many of the big consumer brands are kind of doing trials and testing around them and trying to work out if they you know if they meet the, the kind of particular the kind of barrier properties that they need so that's still an area of development and innovation to, to kind of get the, the, the sort of barrier properties for oxygen and water and other things like that so so you know there's just there's, there's trials out there so i know not pla who do the kind of ehus they're doing um sauce sachets with just eat um you know for ketchup and things like that so rather than the kind of plastic sachets using them in seaweed um, and lots of other kind of use cases as well that are being explored so it's a kind of matter of, of scaling and getting to that that point where it's kind of a widespread which we're not at yet Sokna is Nestle looking at this as well you must be Yes, so definitely our Nestle Institute of Packaging Science, where we have um, 50 scientists looking at packaging innovation, they are looking at this all compostable and biodegradable solutions as well, and seeing for which applications it could be viable because mm -hmm. Packaging serve a purpose of protecting the food um, it contains for us. Um, so one of the challenges is really, as Mark was saying, to ensure that it is meeting the barrier requirements we have for moisture, for oxygen, sometimes for light as well. Um, and those are the challenges we need to overcome along with the scalability of these solutions. Maybe this is a question that came up in the last one and, and we're really yeah, getting short on time, but I. I think that the biodegradability and compostable um, packaging, how do we feel that fits into um, circularity? And arguably it's, it's, is it linear because it ends there or is it circular because it's back to, does that, we feel that contributes to circular, you know, regenerative um, agriculture is that something that that you know the circular economy world is is embracing and and supportive of generally i think Mark, it's it's really but, you know like the other solutions it's not a silver bullet one and there are applications for which it would make environmental sense to have them if you have heavy contamination with food for example, where it will be really costly in terms of energy to recycle, then it might be better to have a compostable packaging that you can compost together with your food waste, um, rather than trying absolutely to recycle everything. So it's really about identifying the right applications for it. Like the wrapping on the cucumbers. Yeah, just to add, Steve, uh, some of you will be familiar with the, the famous butterfly diagram for Ellen MacArthur Foundation of all the loops, and it's like blue and green. And the blue is all the kind of technical things we've been talking around, you know, around products and materials, things that we make. But the other half of it is the biological cycle, which is all the kind of organics, so exactly those things. So that's a big part of it. How do you do to kind of link into regenerative farming? How do you kind of look at that from end of life all the way back? Fabulous. Well, I'm supposed to wrap things up now, but I feel uh, we could probably squeak out just a few more minutes and I'm just tempted to skip down to the question from Alexi um, about just to give you all maybe a final word. Um, and Alexi's asking, you know, what should we take away or do differently after this summit? Um, and I, I'm thinking, you know, it doesn't even need to necessarily be directed at our at the individuals in the audience, because I note that uh, a question that was already answered from Maria, you know, about um, where do we see opportunities in legislation? So maybe one of the things we might suggest is that we, uh, you know, what should we be lobbying for? Um, can I start, uh, Matt, we haven't heard from you for a couple of minutes. Can I start with you? What's your, what's your big, your number one takeaway? 
yeah i think just from the um obviously the, the point about policy i know there's a um hopefully in a couple in a month or so the government is due to kind of release a consultation around kind of a whole change to the the infrastructure around kind of electronics within within the uk so there's a huge opportunity there for kind of it'll be open to everyone to kind of put their thoughts in about you know as a consumer of electronics you know what would make it easier and for, for you, you know, at the end of life, you know, when you've got products in terms of repair to feed into that to get your, your thought, because it hasn't been reviewed for about coming up to kind of 10, 10 years. Um, and obviously recycling rates have kind of stagnated. And as we've touched on, there's a huge opportunity there to move away from just thinking about recycling, but reuse and redistribution and of, 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 of electronics out there. So for me, it's kind of yeah, using your position as a just consumer, both of electronics and, and, and packaging to get you know get your opinion out there and i suppose from a, a business point of view yes looking at those levers around you know making reducing the barriers to things like repair such as you know re reducing kind of vat on it um and and you know and, and vat on, on parts to then make it much more cost effective for the consumer to make that decision of oh actually yeah i will you know repair it because actually it's far more cost effective to me because at the moment you know, in some cases you might be only like 50 pounds less than say a brand new phone some, some people be like Oh well, I'll just pay the extra to get a brand new phone, which is not the right kind of behaviour you want. So, as making it as, as cost effective to make that repair, um, you know, the the right choice, um, which obviously then supports you know the conversations we're talking about today. So, is that consultation happening now, or is that something we should be looking out for next month? It's it's not out yet, so it'll be Defra that publish it. It was meant to come out back in July, but because of all the political upheaval um, within the UK, it just gets pushed back and pushed back. Okay, Sokna, briefly, what's your top top action? Top action on policies is really to ensure that, you know, we have supportive policies. And in the UK, there have been a lot of discussions on the reform on extended producer responsibility, which is supposed to drive a more higher recycling rate, but as is right now um, defined by DEFRA, it's not really the case. So. We producers, we are really concerned that we are not really going to get to the desired environmental outcomes with a very weak extended producer responsibility, which is more like a tax than real producer responsibility. And I hope also with the global plastic treaty dialogue coming up in the UK from November, we can also start really to discuss about policies for reusable packaging as well. Thanks, Sakna. Mark, very, very briefly now. <laughs> yeah, my, my message would be, you know, how do you get circularity into your net zero strategy or carbon reduction strategy? So I still don't see it featured uh, often there. And it's got a huge role to play. We won't get to net zero just through switching to renewables. We've got to look at uh, look at circularity and production and consumption as well. So, so go away and find out whoever's responsible for your net zero strategy and work out how it should feature in there. Fabulous, thank you. Harold, the last word. Yeah, building off what Mark said, uh, governments, please get your act together to make the frameworks smart for the future. Businesses see the opportunity, investors get more money into circularity and us consumers, let's change our behavior much faster than we did in the past. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Sokna. Um, really interesting conversation. Thank, I really appreciate you joining us. Thanks to the audience for all of the fabulous questions and comments to keep things moving along. Um, the next session in our summit coming up in just 30 minutes, um, finance mobilization for the circular economy. So all these great ideas um, going to require investment. How do we persuade investors um, that this is the right course of action? Um, we'll be exploring how business models can be designed to eliminate waste before it's created to maximize utilization of energy and materials. Um, and then tomorrow, we're going to be looking at nature-based solutions. So um, three more sessions on nature and then our debate nature versus technology so we hope you'll be able to join us remember just registering for this session does not automatically register you for the next one so the ch the link has been just posted in the chat but it's disappearing fast um please do uh register again and for tomorrow's sessions we look forward to seeing you there 
Um, I don't think there's really time to tell you about our social mobility and SDGs work, but we can flash that slide by and you'll see it again in the next session. Um, if you're not already following us on Twitter and LinkedIn, please do so. Great way to keep in touch with all of our programming. Thanks very much for joining us. Have a great afternoon, but I hope I'll see you again in 30 minutes. Thanks again to our speakers for your fantastic contributions. Most appreciated.